Hey everyone, welcome to Rewearding, the podcast for reconnecting with your authentic self and learning how to own your brand of weird. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Rewearding podcast. I've actually noticed a recurring theme since I recorded the last episode, and so I decided to use that as kind of what I was going to riff on for today's episode. Um, Today's kind of going to be all about taking downtime when we need it in whatever way works best for us. For some of us, this might mean shifting what we're doing to something else or something that requires something different of us than what we have been doing. Uh, For example, for me, I know that this means that if I've had a really mentally or emotionally busy, draining day at work, when I get home, I like to do things that kind of recharge or fill those cups. So that might mean that I read a book, I play a video game with my stepson, or sometimes he'll ask me to play a game so he can watch because it allows him to connect with me and then we have an absolute blast as he tries to tell me what to do. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's not, but it's entertaining regardless. Sometimes that means I play a game or watch a movie or something with my husband, or I'll play a game or hang out and talk with my mom or my friends. These are all things that allow me to shift from one space in my life to another and to give the space that is feeling worn down or busy or just like it needs a respite to have that. For others of us, that might mean slowing down in a more complete way. This could be taking a day of rest where it's complete rest, like we do nothing, we veg out, we are basically like a potato. We just chill all day, which is totally valid. Or maybe we do less, so we sleep in a little bit, we go to bed earlier, we maybe had a plan to do 10 things and we only end up doing five. Or we decide instead of doing things that are very busy and very active, we do things that require that we slow down and we be present, like making bread or doing some knitting or crochet or taking time to write or read a book. These all require us to slow down and allow our physical body or other aspects of ourself to recover after a really busy day or a busy week, and it lets us recharge for what lies ahead. And of course, anytime I think about finding rest or downtime, I always come back to this story from when I worked at a nursing home in an Alzheimer's and dementia unit. I'm going to share that with you guys today. So I call it the busy worker bee story. And this is after a statement that was actually shouted at me by the elder who told me this whole story. It was actually a lecture because he claimed that we were all, all of the staff there running around like busy worker bees. And he decided to lecture me about the need to slow down. So I always like to preface the story by saying I was one of those kids growing up. I was very hyperactive, very busy, and this continued well into adulthood. In fact, if I'm perfectly honest with you, I am still that hyperactive, busy child today. I don't like to slow down very often. I am always doing something or trying something new. And back then, at that time, I was actually working multiple jobs. I was volunteering at two different locations, and I was attending college because who needs to ever sleep? The nursing home was my primary job, and the elders there often joked that I would answer the question, how are you, with answers like, I'm tired, or I'm hungry, because I would forget to sleep or eat, and that was all I could ever think of to say when they'd ask. In fact, this was such a running joke that one of the elders who had come from Germany taught me how to say I am tired and I am hungry in German. She said it was the least that I could do is to learn how to say it in her native tongue because it was all I ever said to her. I feel like I probably said more, but she was pretty adamant and so I did. I learned how to respond in German every time she'd ask me how I was doing. On this particular day of the story though, I was really busy. Like I had schoolwork going on. I was possibly had my textbook on my housekeeping cart and was reading it as I was walking with my cart. I was behind on projects at work that needed to be done, and I was just generally not functioning at my most optimal. As I was working, I was mentally calculating every task down to pretty close to the second, I would say. I was like mentally going through, okay, as I push this cart, I can read four sentences between rooms and it's going to take me this many seconds to get parked, grab what I need and go into the room. It takes this many minutes to clean the room thoroughly. It's going to take me this many minutes to then go and do the next task. It was kind of ridiculous, I will admit. 
And as I'm going through this whole process, one of the elders kept trying to get my attention. And at first I kept just writing it off as, oh, it's just one of the old people being, you know, weird or having a delusion or something like that. Because I was young and I wasn't exactly the most mm, woke, I guess we could say, about understanding what Alzheimer's and dementia meant and all of the positive things that these people still have to give us. I was one of those young kids who was like, ah, they're just old. Again, not recognizing in my very early 20s, like 2021, 20, the values that people have, even as they age. In fact, the there's more value in the lessons that they can share with us as they get older than sometimes the stories of people who are younger because they've gone through and seen so much. And I wasn't in a space at that time to honor all of that. So as I'm going through work, this, this elder, he kept trying to get my attention and he would go, Psst, and I'd look around and I'm like, who the heck is that? And I couldn't figure it out. So I'd kind of go on about my day and pretty soon I'd hear Psst, again and eventually figured out who it was. I was like, great. He wants to talk again. I was very dramatic. And so I rotated my wrist, my wristwatch so that I could see what the time was because I talk with my hands and I knew I was going to be talking to him. And I went over there and I thought I was being very sneaky. I could check the time. Of course, as I'm gesturing, he would never know. Very smart about this, I thought. And he began the story by saying, you people, you just walk around here like busy worker bees, just biz, 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 biz all day. You never just stop. You never listen. You never are just here. And of course, being early 20s, I went, I'm always listening. I am stopped right now. And I did a dramatic gesture so I could check the time and went, shoot, it's already been like a minute. This is not going to go well. I'm going to have to like skip parts of my day in order to get everything I have to done. Ugh, right? This sucks. And he challenged me and he said, you're not. You're not just, you're not listening. You're not stopped. You're not just breathing. You're not here. And he was very blunt about how I was not paying attention. I was not being respectful. I tried to disagree and argue, and what well, probably, had I not argued, been just a few minute conversation turned into, I would honestly probably say over 45 minutes of him telling me that if I didn't just stop and listen and pay attention, he was going to take me outside and he was going to shoot a moose and make me chase it, make me chase it five miles so that I could learn how to be patient. I thought that was a joke. I later found out from his kids that was like a legitimate thing that he would do is that he would teach you how to track and be patient by wounding an animal and you would have to go and, and follow it and find it. And that was how you learned how to hunt and how to be patient. So of course I am writing off everything he's saying as he's lecturing me because I'm like, you whatever, like you're in an Alzheimer's unit. You don't know what you're talking about. Of course I'm just stopped. I am listening. I am breathing. Now, looking back on it, I can see I was not, I was not present when he was talking to me. I was not doing very good breathing. I was doing shallow breathing. I was doing very fast breathing because I was busy and I wasn't giving myself the space to honor that I needed to slow down or have some downtime. So he continued the lecture and was very blunt. And he said, you know, next time you get really stressed out, I want you to just stop and just breathe until that's all you're thinking about. And of course, I went, oh, yeah, sure, sure, I'll, um, I'll give that a try the next time. You know, thank you so much, sir. Re re great, great lesson. Thank you. And went on about my day as I'm thinking, great, now I'm not going to get my break. I probably will have to skip lunch. I'm going to not be able to study as much as I wanted to. Ugh. Go on about my day, totally writing off everything he said, not intending to ever follow his recommendation, to be honest. And a couple weeks passed. And I'm finally at that point where like, I feel like I'm on the verge of a mental breakdown because I'm busy. I'm not honoring that I need rest. I'm not taking downtime. I have not tried changing anything that I'm doing. I'm still going to work at all my jobs and going to all the volunteering gigs and also going to school and trying to maintain social relationships, which I was not great at. And I finally am pushing the cart like on the verge of tears. Look over, see him. He does the little pssst thing again. I'm like, nope, I'm not doing it. <sighs> this is some BS. Like, it won't work. I'm not even going to try. This is ridiculous. Continue with my day. Start to get more and more stressed. Feel more and more distressed. 
more like I have absolutely lost control. Like there's, I, I'm not going to get everything done. This I'm failing. Immediately start all the horrible negative self-talk because that's what you do, right? And I finally, as he's looking at me, go, you know what? I ugh, Nothing else is working. I'm just I'm going to try it. I'm going to try what he said because what do I have to lose at this point? Absolutely nothing. I'm behind. We're short-staffed. The world is over. So I decided, fine, park my cart and I breathe and immediately reaffirm to myself, see, this isn't working because it didn't help and I'm not less stressed. Take another breath. Try to breathe a little deeper. And I kept breathing, focusing just on getting a deep breath. It went all the way down to the diaphragm, completely expanded my chest and then slowly exhaling. And as I did that, I started noticing once I only was thinking about the breath and every time I'd get distracted and I'd start thinking about, oh, I've got this to do and I've got this to do and I've got this to do, I would come back to, nope, just focus on that breath. Just <sighs> breathe. And the more I just focused on that breath until that was all I was thinking about, the calmer I felt, the more grounded I felt, the more in the moment I felt. And while I wish that I could tell you that he was totally wrong and I did not get more done that day and just breathing was really not that effective, I would be lying if I told you that because what ended up happening was after I just focused on that breath and just brought myself into that moment, I got more done, like way more done. I got every project I needed to done and then some. I got all of my work tasks done and then some. I was able to have time to actually engage with the elders a little bit. I got my schoolwork done later that night. I felt so less distressed. I actually felt confident and present and in the moment. And like I could totally rock anything that came my way because I listened to what he had said. And after that, I started recognizing the value in what the elders were sharing with me. And that just because they viewed life as you need to go slower, you need to be this, you need to do that, didn't necessarily mean I had to incorporate all of it, but it also meant I couldn't discount everything they told me because they were right. I was a very busy person. I am a very busy person. And taking that time to slow down and recharge provided more value, allowed me to do more, allowed me to be more present allowed me to actually honor what my body and my mind and my emotions and everything needed. And so I am very grateful that I got to spend that time working with those elders and that I did eventually learn my lesson and I learned to honor what they had to share. And I'm really grateful that I get to share those sorts of stories with people today. And I've built my entire career based on a lot of those lessons I received. Because when we take that time to just breathe and be present, we are able to do so much more with ourselves and with our lives than if we get so caught up in the, I have to be hyperproductive and I have to do all of this and I need to do all of that and I can't stop and I can't slow down and I shouldn't have flaws and I can't do this. It doesn't allow us to actually be where we are and be who we are. So I hope that the busy worker bee story is helpful for you. I will totally admit that it probably gets a little different every time I retell it because I've been telling it now for uh, unfortunately 18 years because uh, I'm kind of getting old myself and it's it's such a good story it's such a good lesson to learn and I'm excited that I get to share these sorts of lessons with people today so when we find ourselves feeling stressed out feeling like the world is kind of sort of over it's important to take that time, get in touch with what we really need in order to feel grounded and present and in the moment. Sometimes it really is as simple as just being present with the breath. Sometimes it's making time for those things that let us slow down. Maybe we get creative. Maybe we haven't been playing very much and we just need to go and have fun and do something totally goofy that we haven't done since we were a kid. Maybe we need to get messy. Right? When was the last time you had a water gun fight or painted without worrying about where the paint landed? Those sorts of things, that play 
allows your body to recharge, to regenerate a little bit. It allows your emotional cup to get refilled. It lets your mental cup get refilled because play and rest are just as important as being active and doing all of the things. And when we don't take time to honor all aspects of ourselves, we are missing out on some quality of life stuff. And this kind of brings me to another thing that I think we often miss out on, on top of the learning how to breathe and being present in the moment and honoring that space for downtime or rest. It's the value of our flaws. So these are those things that we look at them and we're like, ugh, I have this flaw, or that's a fault of mine. I really should probably work on that, or oh, this is a weakness that I have. I'm really bad at, insert random thing here. Those flaws have value even if it can be hard to see it or we don't want to recognize it for what it is. Whether it's we recognize the value of them later in our life or we learn how to accept them as they are right now, our flaws are a part of who we are. They are a part of the picture that makes up all the whole image of you. For example, I wouldn't be the person that I am if I weren't also hyperactive, quirky, and prone to doing really random things. I am that person who when I accidentally startle a coworker. One of my flaws is I'm not great at saying, are you okay? Instead, I sort of kind of almost fall over laughing, hysterically. Like not a little quiet, like hee hee. It's like a full on belly laugh every time I startle a coworker. This is a flaw. I can't say it's a great thing that I do because if they didn't understand, it's just a, a completely impulsive response. And I'm not actually laughing necessarily at them. It's just I startled them and my brain goes, ha ha, that's kind of funny. And I start laughing. I check on them afterwards, to be clear. And so far, all of my coworkers have been like, it, that's hilarious that you just laugh like that as soon as you realize you've startled us. But it's a flaw, right? It, it's a part of who I am. If I didn't laugh when that happened, they would probably ask me what was wrong. Is, what, did I have something else on my mind? It was it not that big of a startle this time. They would be shocked if I didn't do that thing. It's a flaw, but it's a part of who I am, and it's okay. Now, that isn't to say that if I'm out and about in public and I startle somebody that I should just double over laughing. No, I obviously should have better impulse control when I'm around people that I'm not familiar with. But that's a different thing. That's being able to recognize this is this is a thing I do. This is a flaw. And accepting that sometimes I can work on it and sometimes I maybe don't have to. It just depends on where we're at and what's going on in our world, right? These flaws are an important part of who we are. And accepting them for what they are allows us to live our life in the present without stressing about the need to appear as if we don't have them to begin with. Kind of like my quirkiness. I am and I'm picking on myself a lot this episode, so I hope that's okay. I am terrible at compliments. I don't often remember to give them to people. And when I do, I often preface them in a very weird way. Like a coworker who had done up her hair and makeup. She looked fantastic. In my brain, the compliment came out beautifully, right? I was going to message her on our little instant messenger thing and be like, hey, your hair and makeup are on point today. You look fantastic. What actually came out was not to be that weird and awkward person, but I think your hair and makeup look great today. Not the best way to compliment somebody. She got a kick out of it, told me thank you, and informed me that it wasn't really as weird and awkward as I thought. <laughs> if I had been caught up, though, in I have to word this compliment just right, and I don't want it to be awkward, even though I feel like I'm being awkward, and I need to make sure that she doesn't know that I'm not great at this thing that I'm trying to do right now, I probably never would have sent that compliment. I never would have reached out. When things got stressful later that day, I would not have tried to connect with her and make sure she was okay because I would have been so caught up in, I'm going to do it weird. I'm going to be awkward. I'm not going to do this well. When we see our flaws and we get caught up in how they don't look great or how they might make other people not respond well to us, it can hinder us from engaging with other people or just being our authentic selves. It's okay to have flaws. 
It's okay to not be good at things. And while we often hear that we should be good at things and we shouldn't have these faults and we should hide those ones that we do have and we have to be hyperproductive and we should be as perfect as we can, that's not necessarily true. It's easy to get caught up in that. It's easy to feel like we have to appear a certain way in front of people at all times because, well, social media makes it easy for people to see and judge. Being Putting ourselves out there puts us at risk of being judged. But life is full of highs and lows, of great times and the not great times, of the hard things and the easy things. And our flaws make up a very big part of that. And giving ourselves the space to accept them for what they are can help us be compassionate towards ourselves. It allows us to recognize, sure, I have this flaw or this fault, but I have friends or teammates or coworkers or people in my life where their strengths help compensate for that or they accept it for what it is because it's a part of me and they don't mind. And maybe we get more comfortable being ourselves around them or around other people. And maybe sometimes that can help that flaw not be as big of a thing. Maybe we stop seeing it as, oh, this isn't a good thing that I do this. Maybe it's just a, yep, I'm, you know, just that way. And that's okay because it makes me who I am. It gives me a flavor that nobody else has. And it can be hard to do that and be compassionate towards ourselves because we've been taught so much negative self-talk. We have all of these images of people in the world today where they're perfect or they're airbrushed or, you know, they only show us the good things on social media so we don't see the bad. We don't see the downsides. We don't see the parts where they're struggling. And we feel like we have to have this appearance to the outside world where all things are great even when they aren't. And it is absolutely a never-ending practice to recognize and accept our flaws, but it's so important to get to a space where we can, where we can recognize yeah, this is this is a thing. I struggle with it and that's okay. And it's important to also recognize though that just because we have that flaw and we're like, yep, I got it, doesn't mean we also go, well, this is the flaw and it's just how I am. So that's that then. If we want to work on it and try to improve in that area, then we should. But it should be because we want to and we feel like we will be a better individual, a better friend, a better significant other, a better coworker, a better human because we're choosing to do those things, not because other people look at us and say, well, you shouldn't be like that, so you need to work on it, or because we want to portray this perfection to the world that doesn't even exist. If we see the flaw and we want to work on it, we should. Like if we're tardy to things a lot and we decide, I want to get better at time management because this is kind of getting ridiculous, then we can prioritize things that can help us with that. Maybe we talk to our friends and we're like, hey, and I've done this with a friend actually. I had a friend who was always tardy to the movies. So so we had a talk and she said, you know what? Tell me the movie's starting 30 minutes before it does. And I went, cool, done. So every time I text her, I'm like, hey, we're going to the movies. Don't forget, um, this is the time it's going to be at. I would always tell her at least 30 minutes before the movie started. And then she would show up on time every time. And it was glorious. We were never late to a movie again. She also, funnily enough, used that same tactic with her family when it came time for family dinners or holiday dinners. She knew her brother in particular, he would always show up to a holiday dinner still needing to cook what he was contributing every time. So she would tell him the dinner started over an hour before it actually did. In doing so, it allowed her to recognize and accept his flaw and it helped him improve his time management. So he showed up and he had his part of dinner cooked and ready by the time dinner was actually supposed to start. Does it mean that he was never late again? No. Does it mean that my friend was never late again? Nope. Anytime I forgot to tell her that something was starting 30 minutes earlier than it actually was, she was very rarely on time. And that was okay because I understood we had an agreement that to help her work on the time management, this is what we would do. I would just always tell her it started earlier than it really did. Maybe we set more alarms for ourselves if you know that's the flaw that we decide to work on. 
if, um, for example, I tend to be kind of impulsive, right? Starting the podcast was actually kind of impulsive. I didn't really think it very, through very well. I just went, hmm, I should do it, and I am. If I want to work on impulsiveness, then maybe I start looking at, okay, when I have the thought of I should do the thing, maybe I should take the time to slow down and actually plan out the thing. Then maybe because of how my brain works, I know I should also then define for myself what planning something out looks like. Does it mean I just come up with an outline of all the things I want to talk about? Does it mean I write 27 sticky notes? with simply two to five words each on different episode title ideas because that's the most planning apparently I can do uh, for something like this, then maybe that's how I work on that flaw of impulse control. If I know that um, going back to the falling over laughing at my coworkers when I startle them, if I decide that's a flaw I want to work on, maybe I start working on, okay, I have the impulse to laugh as soon as they get startled. So I can try to take three deep breaths from the time that they startle to my potential laughter. I will take three deep breaths. This allows me to then give myself time to actually rationally think through how I'm going to respond. Maybe we practice whatever it is ahead of time. If we know that we struggle with doing a a speech or something like that, or we're having some trouble making a phone call, maybe we take some time to write out a little script and practice, you know, practice picking up the phone, saying the things we need to say, that sort of thing. If we know that one of our flaws is a lot of negative self-talk, maybe we connect with people who can help us counteract that. Maybe we start practicing how to write out and how to respond to ourselves when we say, oh, I really suck at this. Well, how can I answer back to that? Maybe it's not that I suck at it. Maybe I struggle with it. Maybe it's okay to struggle with it. Maybe instead of saying, I really suck at mm, giving people compliments. Maybe instead I say, I am a little awkward when I give people compliments and that's okay. I am working on it or maybe I'm not working on it. But when I don't fall into that negative self-talk spiral, it can help me accept the flaw for what it is and then I can just deal with it however I choose to deal with it. So it's important that while we're working on recognizing what our flaws are and accepting them for whatever they are, as they are, without judging them, without trying to make them into something that maybe they aren't, or getting too far into a negative self-talk spiral on it, that we are also accepting of where it's okay to grow and change if we want to, right? Just because our flaws are part of who we are doesn't mean we never have to try to change them. If we want to, we can. So really, in the end, as we get closer to wrapping up this episode, what I hope you leave here today with is knowing that it's okay to schedule yourself downtime. It's okay to slow down, shift how you're doing things. Maybe you take more time for yourself than what you thought you were going to take because it's what you need, truthfully. Or that it's okay to accept your flaws, to own them for what they are, and just be your authentic self without judging yourself for being who you are. I can honestly tell you that it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it does make a world of a difference when you can just own, this is who I am, this is how I am, I'm okay with that, and I'm working on it where I want to work on it. Because you don't have to work on it or fix it if you don't want to. Your flaws aren't really something you have to fix. Okay. So thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. I really hope that you found some value in the podcast today and that you enjoyed listening to me. I did it a little bit differently this time. Uh, definitely a lot more riffing and a lot less outlining. So if you have any questions or comments on today's episode, feel free to leave me some comments or send me a direct message over on Instagram at raisa.coaching. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to share with a friend, save for later, or leave me a review. If you would like more content like this, you can find me over on Instagram at raisa.coaching. That's R-E-I-S-E dot coaching.